Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. As Adam just mentioned, I've been doing basic climate disruption presentations for quite a few years. And I always include a 10 minute section on technology. This is an expanded version of that technology section. I've added technologies that I'm interested in primarily and uh, that I've learned more about from webinars and other sources in 2020 during the lockdown. So I really enjoyed putting it together. I hope you'll enjoy it as well. So the first thing I like to talk about is ocean power. There's a lot of interesting opportunities out there for ocean power. This is a system that was put in place in Scotland, started back in 1998. What we have here are cylinders that float and are hinged together here at, the, in, at these locations. And there's generator coils at the hinges as well. So as the cylinders move with the waves, energy is generated. This is actually a 750 kilowatt uh, installation. Another completely different idea, this wave generator is built on shore. The water surges into the underwater chamber to cre create air pressure, which then turns a turbine and that turns a generator. I don't know if there are any pilot plants on this yet, but I just think it's a great idea. Another third option, uh, we have a pylon here on the left that's fastened to the ocean floor and there are generator coils and ocean power is, uh, or electrical power is generated as the float moves up and down with the waves. So there are a number of opportunities out there and there are quite a few more available. This one was put together by Annette Von Juan at OSU, which is Oregon State University. And it turns out that Oregon State has quite a few ocean power research projects going. The latest one is this pack wave uh, opportunity. What they're going to do is put in offshore on, in Oregon, uh, an area where they can test up to four different types of ocean power systems. They will bring that power ashore and study it. And uh, of course, study the viability and the uh, survivability of the systems. So Oregon State seems to be where all the research on ocean power is going on these days. Clean coal. Well, I haven't talked that much about clean coal lately in my presentations because it seems to have kind of gone away, but I wanted to bring it up today uh, just to cover it. It kind of folds into some other things. What we have here is a, an, a power plant here on the right, uh, doing whatever it does, making CO2 emissions, which are then collected and compressed and shipped via pipeline to another location where they're injected into the ground, into a reservoir and sequestered forever in the theory anyway. So this actually could work, but one of the issues with this idea is that our power plants primarily look like this these days. They're old and not particularly well suited for carbon capture. So we really need to start with a new power plant if we're gonna do this and build the system into it. And then you have to find the cavern. So the costs of doing this and using some of the electricity you generate to run the sequestration system and the carbon collection system seems to me to make it not very viable. So I don't know that this is gonna go anywhere anytime soon, but it does kind of tie into carbon removal now this is an artist rendering. I don't think this actually exists yet, but there are carbon removal systems out there. This one's in Switzerland, install, installed by Climeworks. What they have here are 18 CO2 collectors that pull in about two and a half tons of carbon every day. Uh, according to Climeworks, they think that it will take 250,000 of these systems to remove 1% of the annual global carbon dioxide emissions. So that is a lot, a lot of capturing plants and a lot of money to collect 1%. I just don't know if this is feasible, but I'm not ruling anything out these days. Renewable fuels. 
again, one another thing I haven't talked that much about lately because they kind of went off the radar for a while. So I decided to see what's happening. Uh, we're not at the point yet where we can be like Doc Brown and put waste, uh, you know, banana peels, beer cans, and trash into the Mr. Fusion machine, but that's definitely something that we're looking forward to. Not there yet. Ethanol turns out got very popular all of a sudden, but since 2010, it doesn't look like it's really changed a lot. I think the production, it's gone up a little, but it's basically plateaued since around 2010, I think. Now, cellulosic ethanol, which was the big change where we would use extra wasteful materials like corn husks and uh, switchgrass and things like that hasn't really developed and isn't really included in the production numbers. In fact, most of our uh, ethanol comes from the Midwest because what do we use? We use corn as the feedstock, not surprising. There are other feedstocks available. We have wheat, sugar cane, sugar beets, molasses, and many countries all over the world make ethanol from these. And you can see from this chart, we have the fossil fuels here at the bottom, the carbon intensity of some of these productions are quite high, which is one reason that ethanol is still a bit controversial with regard to its carbon footprint. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about that out there. Biodiesel, surprisingly, the production run is about similar to ethanol. It kind of got up to a relatively high level and it's around 2013 and then it kind of leveled off. So it's still out there, it's still being produced. The uh, carbon intensity for biodiesel isn't quite as bad as it is for ethanol, but we do have a, a lot of different uh, feedstocks. We have rapeseed oil, palm oil, still a little bit of waste cooking oil. We use soybeans here in the United States, surprisingly, for mo most of our biodiesel. And uh, like as I said, the carbon intensity is still not great in some countries, but it's not as bad as ethanol. So my takeaway from this research that I did was that production is plateaued for both biodiesel and ethanol. And the carbon footprint is still up for grabs, but we still have possibilities. We can get ethanol from algae and possibly artificial photosynthesis. So that research is continuing. Alternative vehicles. This is one of my favorite subjects, as you'll see. This is a General Motors EV1 from around 1995. If you don't know me, uh, you won't recognize me. That's me behind the door. When I was working at the Ventura County APCD, we had one of these on loan for a couple of months and I got to drive it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was pretty quick, two seater, but the range was only 30 to 40 miles. So it wasn't really good for much of anything but driving back and forth to work. Now, electric vehicles, of course, have been around for a long time. This Detroit electric vehicle was actually produced or one very similar to it by this company between 1907 and 1939. And they produced a few other models as well. So electric vehicles have been around for a long time. Of course, we have better electrics now. We have the uh, Mustang Mach-E just coming out. Uh, Mini Cooper has released a new electric vehicle. And the Nissan Leaf has been around for quite a while. Uh, the Chevy Bolt is out there with a B. And of course, Tesla has many models. This is the Model 3, one of the most popular ones these days. Now, most of these electric vehicles have a range of about 230 to 250 miles, although there are exceptions. Supposedly, the Mustang will go 300 miles. The Mini will only do 110 miles on a charge. And the Nissan Leaf is about 225. To, uh, 226. So this is decent range. I mean, you can do a lot with that, but for me, I would prefer to have something more like 400 to 450 miles of range uh, if so I could do a little bit of long haul traveling. 
But uh, there are some other possibilities out there, the sublime vehicles like the Porsche Taycan, uh, which I understand sold very well last year. They sold 20,000 of these at $100,000 a pop, which is pretty good. The Lucid Air is uh, taking orders. The Light Year I don't think is available yet or in production yet, but this uh, panel on the top is supposed to be solar panels. So that will generate electricity while it's being used. Not enough to run the vehicle, but enough to help out with charging the battery. So the range on these is a little bit higher, the, except for the Porsche, it's only about 250 miles, but the light year and the Lucid have ranges up in the 500 mile range uh, if you get the advanced battery packs. And of course we have China in the game also. We have these very strange little vehicles. I don't know if any of these will actually make it to the United States. My understanding is this Candy K23 might make it, but it could cost as much as $30,000. And the range is only about 188 miles. So it's anybody's guess what will happen with the Chinese vehicles. Of course, we have electric pickups coming, the Cybertruck we've all probably heard about. It's supposed to have a 500 mile range and that would be nice. Uh, this is an alternative design I ran across, which I thought would be a little more, con not exactly as wild as the first one, but either way, there are other trucks also on the way. Rivian is supposed to have a, an SUV and a pickup. Ford F-150 electric vehicle pickup is on the way. And GM is, uh, pr is proposing three new Hummers. The first one, uh, in the fall of this year. Now, the interesting thing about the Hummer and some of these others is the range is, does tend to be a little bit higher between 300 and 350 miles. Rivian is claiming they might be able to get 400 miles. Uh, but the thing about the Hummer is that it's a very heavy vehicle, but you can see with this cutaway that the Ultium battery here is very thick and very large. So they're compensating for the weight of the vehicle by putting an extra large battery into it. We have uh, semi-tractors on the way from Tesla and at least one other company. And I thought it was interesting that these vehicles will not be that much more expensive than a, a Peterbilt sleeper, which runs about $150,000. And that's the same as they're proposing for uh, the Tesla semi-tractors. So they should be relatively affordable. And of course, there's uh, electric coaches out there and electric school buses, all kinds of different transportation opportunities. One last electric vehicle, the Tesla Roadster, now supposedly coming out this year, aside from going 100, 250 miles per hour top speed, the range is proposed to be 620 miles. Now this is a $200,000 car, so I don't know how many of us will be able to afford one, but if they can squeeze batteries for 620 miles of range in this tiny little car, I will be very impressed. So I'm really anxious to see how this turns out. And if you don't wanna buy an electric vehicle, you can always convert one in, into an electric vehicle. This is a proposed EV West Revolt electric crate motor. So what they've got here is basically uh, an electric motor system that will just fit into where a small block Chevy V8 would have been in a vehicle. So what this is here is a Tesla Model S motor and a reduction gear. And then here on the left is a U-joint which fastens right up to the um, to the to the drivetrain of the uh, of the vehicle, so you supposedly can just whip the engine out and just pop this in and have an electric vehicle. Of course, you have to install batteries and a control system, but this is an opportunity that that may be available sometime in the near future. It's supposed to be very expensive, probably because Tesla doesn't sell their motors, so. This is my guess. I'm guessing that they're going to be coming out of wrecked Teslas. So, and there, there are only a limited number of those. So 
I don't quite know how they're going to swing this, but it is, an, it is one thing that's coming out. Another uh, opportunity, uh, Chevrolet is coming up with an e-crate system to, to transform your uh, GM vehicle into an electric vehicle. This is basically taking the guts out of a Chevy Bolt and installing it into, in this case, a 1977 GM K5 Blazer. Now, my assumption is that this has been transformed from a rear, rear wheel drive vehicle to a front wheel drive vehicle, although I have no proof of that. Uh, but the bolts are definitely front wheel drive. And uh, this is definitely a bolt battery pack, which is conveniently sized to fit in this blazer. It wouldn't fit in many cars. But this is a system that may become available for transformation into an electric vehicle. So I think electric vehicles are pretty much the state of the art these days. I used to think that hybrids were. This is a hybrid vehicle, 1916 Owen Magnetic. Just like the hybrids today, it had a gasoline engine, gas tank, batteries, and electric motor. I don't think it worked particularly well, and it was different than what we have now, but it definitely existed in the early 1900s. I'm gonna speak mostly about these uh, plug-in hybrids because they will run on the battery for a while before you switch to gasoline. The uh, Ford and the Toyota do 25 miles on the battery. The Honda Clarity will do 47 miles on the battery. I'm fortunate enough to have a Chevy Volt with a V. It will do about 60 to 65 miles on the battery. So I can drive around Ventura County pretty much anywhere and back on battery without using any gas, which I think is pretty good. And I've proven that in 2020 with the lockdown, I only used 10.5 gallons of gasoline the whole year since I really didn't go anywhere. So, uh, and the lifetime mileage for the Volt for me, I bought this, this is a 2017 model, uh, has been 125 miles per gallon. So I'm pretty pleased with that. I'm also pretty bullish on fuel cell vehicles which is a vehicle that makes the electricity for the EV inside the car. Now, this Honda Clarity has been around for quite a few years testing here in Southern California. The Mirai is out there. I haven't seen a Hyundai Nexo yet, but these um, don't have terrific range uh, opportunities either. They range from 312 miles on a tank of what? Hydrogen to about 380s on a tank of hydrogen for the Hyundai. So um, that's okay again, but not the best. Now we do have the hydrogen storage tanks here in the back and they're from what I understand, typically carbon fiber tanks, double lined. And then there's a battery and then the um, fuel stack and control system here up in front. Now, the question is, which may be on your, on your breath, uh, where do we get the hydrogen? Well, there are hydrogen fueling stations around Southern California. The green ones are the ones online and working and the yellow are in development. But notice that here in Ventura County, there's not much available. One fueling station in Thousand Oaks, but if you wanna drive a fuel cell vehicle in Ventura County, you're kind of kind of in bad shape. So uh, we're not quite there yet, but I'm gonna mention something about that in a minute. First of all, though, I wanted to just point out that there are some naysayers for fuel cell vehicles. In this case, we're assuming that uh, we're using renewable energy for everything. So if you directly charge your electric battery vehicle, uh, with renewable energy, your overall efficiency is 73%. For a fuel cell vehicle, you have to create the hydrogen with electrolysis, and then you transport it. The overall efficiency is 22%. In this case, they're taking the hydrogen that they 
produced by electrolysis and making a liquid fuel out of it with a chemical process and used in an, an internal combustion engine and the overall the efficiency is 13%. So for the fuel cell, they're not really bullish on that, but I still think there's a lot of opportunity for fuel cell vehicles and I like it. Speaking of hydrogen, there has been a fair amount of talk about how we're gonna distribute hydrogen to create a hydrogen network. This is a paper on blending hydrogen into the natural gas pipeline network, which has come up more than once over the last year. Uh, ARB sponsored in July a hydrogen conference and there were several speakers. One of them was making the case that hydrogen has much better op um, is much better for storage than some of the other energy storage options like pumped water, compressed air and batteries. And another speaker was uh, giving an example of what a hydrogen system might look like at the ports. We have methane reformers here making hydrogen and carbon, which must be sequestered again, as I was talking about earlier. We have hydrogen storage. We have a little more hydrogen coming in from electrolysis. And um, the hydrogen going out to fuel cell vehicles here, but also hydrogen going out for combustion. It turns out, and this actually surprised me, that there's quite a bit of research going on for converting combustion sources like this combined cycle power plant to burn hydrogen rather than natural gas. So uh, that's, an, that's an area of research that's going forward. Solar power, love this. This is uh, Limonera in Santa Paula. It's a one megawatt solar farm. It's five acres installed in around 2008. And I think it's still in operation. And these are, of course, solar photovoltaic cells. We have another system here where mirrors shine the sunlight to a central location. And that location gets fairly hot, as you might, might imagine. And then that heat is used to make steam and the steam is used to make electricity. Of course, we use steam to make electricity now. It's just made from mostly fossil fuels. So this is a relatively low carbon source of uh, electricity. One uh, system like this is in operation in California. This is the Ivanpah generating station out on I-15 just before you get to Nevada. This is a shot from the highway that I took. Uh, so you should be able to see these operational if we're ever able to go to Vegas again. So uh, keep a lookout look out for them there on I-15. Home solar is getting less expensive all the time because the panels are getting less expensive all the time. So if you're not already thinking about home solar, you might consider it, take a look at, see if it would pay off for you. One uh, advantage to home solar that's really recently come into play is home solar with battery storage. Now, these, this is the Tesla Powerwall and a Panasonic battery system. There are other systems out there as well. And these enable you to go off grid if there's a blackout or an emergency. You can island yourself and uh, not have to worry about whether there's grid power or not. In fact, some of the battery system owners I know use their solar panels during the day and the battery at night and they're really not on the grid ever, which is great. Wind power, there's wind all over the place out in the Midwest. It's, it shocked me when I was traveling out there in the last few years, there's probably a hundred wind turbines in this photograph, uh, which interests me because we sort of started the wind turbine thing here in California, we had the San Gorgonio Pass wind farm uh, in the Coachella Valley. We probably had these little tiny wind turbines out there. Turns out there were 3,218 of them and it was a 615 megawatt system. So about the size of a decent power plant. 
But of course, our wind turbines are much larger now, 187 megawatts for one. Uh, this is a photo of some guys doing some maintenance on a wind turbine. And just for reference, uh, a blade on a long haul truck. And this is one of my favorite shots because it shows the uh, service island here in the center where all the people are and the relative size compared to the wind turbines that it is servicing. So these are huge wind turbines. And it looks like we're going to be seeing some wind turbine power offshore here in California at some point. Now, uh, these areas are off uh, Morro Bay. They're calling this one the Diablo Canyon area and this one the Morro Bay area. They're proposing wind turbines out in these, both of these areas. These are in federal waters, so the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is in charge. And now there's a timeline, but I'm not exactly sure. I couldn't tell where we're at on the timeline, but I think we'll be seeing these in the future. Also, by the way, the studies are showing that you won't be able to see them from the shore during the day. You might be able to see a, a light at night, but during the day they'll be pretty much invisible. Now this fascinates me and I wanted to share it with you. This was two days ago, January 11th. The renewable here is in green. And so we have wind and other renewables for the first part of the day and then boom, solar pops in to a large extent. It's a very substantial solar presence here in California. And then of course it goes away in the evening and some other renewables take, take, uh, take over. But, and we still have quite a bit of natural gas use. That's what this orange line is. This is natural gas picking up in the evening. Um, I just am astonished that the uh, solar is so prevalent in our renewable resources. Here's a, a chart of that same day for the solar uptick. And I guess this is what they call the duck curve or the one before was the duck curve. So solar is gonna just continue to grow here in California over the next few years. And uh, speaking of solar growing, we are here in Ventura County hosting a new energy storage facility. This is in Oxnard off of Ventura, uh, Vineyard Avenue, actually. This is a rendering and actually this system might be in place by now, I don't know. It was supposed to go in, uh, start construction on June of 2020, but this is the, the system here. And then they have another blank area, empty area here to put in another one, hopefully. They're going to uh, use Tesla Megapacks for this particular system. This is 100 megawatts. It'll service 80,000 homes for four hours. And then you have to recharge it. Now, this is another system that's already in place owned by SCE, this is in Ontario. It looks very large, but actually this is only a 20 megawatt system. Uh, these might be different battery packs, probably are. So it'll only do 15,000 households for four hours. And there are, of, of course, other energy storage systems. We have the batteries here. There's the flywheel system where a flywheel is turning with uh, power from electricity in a vacuum on magnetic bearings to cut down on friction. And then when we need electricity, you go back to generation with that uh, radial motion. Uh, a couple of other opportunities, pumping water to a higher reservoir. And then when you need electricity, you let it flow down into a generating station and uh, compressed air. Compressed air is pumped into a cavern and when energy is needed, it's let out and runs through a turbine and generator. So there are other opportunities. I have one last one here I think is particularly interesting. This is solar thermal power. And uh, this is a, a plant in Morocco that can store up to 100 megawatt hours of thermal energy in a bed of packed gravel. 
And uh, this exists, but I don't have any information on how efficient it is, but it definitely is in, is in production already in Morocco. So last big subject, nuclear power. Nobody in the climate movement likes to talk about nuclear power. Fusion keeps popping up every few years. 2015, there was a big article in Time about it. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about fission reactors, which turns out are being downsized these days. This new scale fission reactor is basically the same as a larger reactor. It's a traditional light water reactor. It's only 60 megawatts, though. And um, it's 65 feet tall, nine feet in diameter. And it's designed to be used at small for small towns and remote locations. And it can be, um, it, the output can vary so it can fill in some of that duct curve we were just looking at a little while ago. Now there's at least two more systems out there. This is one developed by the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It's called the Ultra Safe Nuclear Corp. And it's a similar design. Uh, this one's supposedly lower power density, so it's less susceptible to meltdown. But the interesting thing is it's sealed when it's installed. It's fueled once and it never is refueled again. With the 20 year life, it's supposed to, uh, it'll supposed to run for 20 years on one fueling. So that's one, another, uh, opportunity for nuclear fission. A third one I don't know as much about. This is only a 1.5 megawatt system for electric power and heat. Uh, apparently the heat is used to make electricity. There's not a lot of detail about what this is, but uh, it's another third small uh, fission system out there that's gonna be available at some point in time, probably. Now, uh, back to fusion. I am not a nuclear engineer. I don't know that much about nuclear power, but I'm going to go over these really quick because I think they're kind of interesting. We have the tokamak here, the magnetized target reactor, and the colliding beam reactor. Now, the tokamak is, uh, this is a, a mock-up uh, rendering, I believe, but this actually is being developed. And what happens is that the, the um, plasma torus is kept in check with all these semiconductor, superconductor magnets, and heat is extracted and used to make electricity. This is the inside of the one that's being constructed. You can see it's not very big. There's a guy here that's working on it, but they're building a bigger one in France, 35 nations have gotten together to build a huge tokamak about 10 times larger than the Commonwealth Fusion. And they're hoping to have this working by 2035. So we'll see where that goes. They're obviously willing to spend 20 billion on it, so they must think it will work. General Fusion, this is a totally different system. It turns out that these protrusions here are mechanical pistons. And I'm gonna read the description on this. The, the pistons mechanically smash the sphere of molten lead that encases the plasma. The hollow space at the center of the sphere crunches down on the plasma, raising its density to the point where the ions of heavy hydrogen merge together to make helium and release energy. So there's molten lead in here and plasma. I think this has the unfortunate characteristic of looking like a coronavirus, but these are all pistons that crunch down on the plasma. Interesting idea. Now this runs at about 100 million degrees centigrade. This particular system, the TAE technology system, is based on boron and runs at about three billion with a B degrees. What they've got here, again, I'm gonna read the description. Instead of fusing isotopes of hydrogen together, TAE is working on fusing single protons of nuclei of boron. The reaction results in an ion of standard carbon, but one that is too energetic to remain stable. 
It falls apart, decaying into three helium ions and a burst of gamma rays. So the plan is to get, to shoot ions in from either side and then extract energy from the same outside containers here. So again, I don't really understand that much about this, but it's a fascinating idea. I don't know how they're gonna get it to work, especially at 3 billion degrees. So what can we do? I think the basic thing that we all can do is um, drive more efficient vehicles. And we need to work on that. We're pretty much dead last in the fuel efficiency sweepstakes across the world. All these countries are doing better than we are. Uh, there is research going on on platooning vehicles. So there could be a long line of long haul trucks here that communicate with vehicle to vehicle communication. So you can basically draft each other safely without having to worry about engine uh, without having to worry about accidents or anything that's what we used to call it when i was a kid drafting uh so that's being worked on led light bulbs i always like to bring that up vampire power uh turn off your your electronics if they're not being used this especially goes for chargers turn them off unplug them and you can measure the the electricity with this kilowatt meter, which I do all the time. One last thing drives me nuts. Uh, in 2016, we used 97 quads of energy in the United States. 64.4 quads were wasted, gone, rejected, and 30.8 quads were used. If you think it's gotten better over the years, it hasn't. This is 1970. We used 67 quads total. We rejected 30 quads and used about 31 quads. So we're using a little bit, pretty much the same amount of energy now. We're just wasting twice as much. So that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. There's a lot we didn't get to, but there's no time.